We are in uh, Luke chapter 15, the 15th chapter of the Gospel of Luke is, is widely known, uh, particularly because it contains uh, the parable <clears throat> of the, the prodigal son. Uh, but as we saw in our last lesson, that parable doesn't stand alone, but is the third in a series uh, the Lord delivered in a specific setting. We studied the first two in our last lesson in verses 1 through 10, the parable of the lost sheep and the parable of the lost coin. Uh, the three together unite to form a single message setting forth God's love for sinners, his devotion to pursuing those lost uh, sinners, and the joy that results uh, when the lost are found. When the shepherd found his one lost sheep, he called his friends and neighbors uh, to rejoice with him. And when the woman found her precious coin she had lost, uh, she did the same. But at the a conclusion of each, Jesus professed that there would be more joy than either in God's heaven when one sinner repents. Now we might say the Lord digs even deeper to describe the joy a father feels when a much loved son returns to him after becoming lost to rebellion and sin. But the setting of the three parables uh, found in the first two verses of the chapter, remember, uh, is especially important. Luke describes in those two verses how the spiritually lost of his own day were responding to the one whom the heavenly Father had sent. Uh, Luke writes that all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near him to listen to him. That was one category of the lost. Uh, and the tense of the verb is intended to describe an irresistible uh, draw Jesus seemed to have upon that despised group. They were continually streaming uh, to hear him. Uh, but the second group is described as well, the highly respected Pharisees and scribes. They were appalled and they snidely scorned how Jesus sullied himself by taking meals with the sinners. And in their scorn, they were unknowingly revealing themselves to be lost as well. But without pausing in verse 11, uh, Jesus took up the third parable. And he said, a man had two sons. Uh, the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. So he divided his wealth between them. And not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together. The sense of that might be uh, more cashed everything in, but be that as it may, he gathered everything together and he went on a journey into a distant country and there he squandered his estate with loose living. Now when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in that country and he began to be impoverished. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the swine were eating, uh, students of the passage understand that to be carob pods. He would have gladly filled his stomach with the carob pods that the swine were eating and no one was giving anything to him. <clears throat> but when he came to his senses, uh, literally when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired men have more than enough food? Uh, but I am dying here with hunger. I will get up and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. So he got up and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and, and felt compassion for him and ran and embraced him and, and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father 
we might add here, interrupted him. The father said to his slaves, quickly, bring out the best robe and and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fattened calf, kill it and let's eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found. And they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. And he summoned one of the servants and began inquiring what these things could be. And he said to him, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf, and because he has received him back safe and sound. But he became angry and was not willing to go in, and his father came out and began pleading uh, with him. But he answered and said to his father, look, for, look, for so many years I have been serving you and uh, I have never neglected a command of yours and that you have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came who has devoured your wealth with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you have always been with me, and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice. For this brother of yours was dead and has begun to live and was lost and has been found. What a moving story. Uh, both lovely and strange all at once. Charles Dickens considered it the greatest short story ever written. And Walter Liefeld, one of the more helpful commentators on the gospel, called it one of the world's supreme masterpieces of storytelling. In one sense, it's a simple story. There are two sons and a father Uh, Christians familiar with the parable will often confess that in their memories they often forget that there was both the younger son, the prodigal, and his older uh, brother. Uh, But the older, less well-known brother may very well have been the reason for Jesus telling the parable in the first place. He is in the story at the start. A man had two sons. Each has a lesson to offer. But the first half of the parable concerns the younger brother and his sinful behavior. He's described as longing to throw off the stifling shackles of home and his father's authority he considers to be preventing him from the kind of fulfillment he longs for. He was ready to sow his oats, uh, get out from under the shadow of his father and be his own man free to pursue the pleasures he knew awaited him beyond the confines of home. It's obvious from the description of the home that it was an affluent one. Uh, There were fields and servants and an an, an inheritance to be had from a father who had every intention of leaving it behind for his two sons. But like most inheritances, While the expected inherited windfall was there uh, waiting the day, it was not what we'd call today a liquid source of wealth. It likely consisted mostly of land holdings that were held in a way to provide annual income from its produce. The younger son was not in a frame of mind to wait, however, so he demanded of his father an earlier Uh, distribution of the share of his inheritance that was to fall to him. This was an uncommon thing and likely considered an insult on top of the sorrow his father would feel, knowing that his son preferred the world's pleasures to loyalty to him. Plus, it would require the father to divide the inheritance uh, then and there, meaning Uh, the likely disposition of his assets in order to accommodate the young man. It was a requirement of the law 
as stipulated in Deuteronomy 21:17, that the eldest son receive a double share of all that the father held. So the younger son would have only taken a third of the assets, while the remaining two thirds uh, promised to the older brother was held in abeyance until the proper time. Uh, why the father agreed to his demand is not clear, but it is likely that he knew the younger son's spirit and judged the best thing he could do for him was to acquiesce and let the young man get what the father knew would be coming to him. So he divided his wealth and gave the share to the young son, uh, who then, according to verse 13, not many days later, monetized uh, the son. That's the likely meaning there, and he went on a journey. Road trip. The phrase conjures up in our minds an exciting adventure. A, a break from the mundane routines of life and the possibility of pleasures and experiences previously unknown, uh, even taboo. He went on a journey into a distant country, Jesus says. It sounds exotic and exciting, and it surely was, for he goes on to say he engaged in loose living. Uh, what that means exactly, he doesn't say, but most of us can probably imagine it. Uh, he tested his new freedom and experienced things he had not imagined possible. Uh, flush with money, uh, he was able to make this new style of living a, a habitual thing, catching the eye of a new set of acquaintances drawn to his lifestyle who encouraged him in it. The young man blindly and naively went on a spending spree somehow taking no thought of the consequences. But of course there were uh, consequences, a, a fundamental law. I took one business course in, in, in college <laughs> and I became a businessman. But anyway, I took one <laughs> business course in college, personal finance, a, a fundamental, law, fundamental law of personal finance was being transgressed the whole time he indulged himself. Cash expenditures can continue as long as there is cash flow. Uh, the law is inviolable and did not spare the young prodigal. Jesus says he squandered it all and soon he had spent everything. We can imagine the panic that came over him. How could he not have seen it coming. How could he have been so foolish? His new friends abandoned him overnight and he was forced to face his dilemma alone. The realities of life came crushing in on him. But then things got even worse, if you can imagine. Famine struck this far country, making employment and the necessities of living even harder to come by. Life can happen like that, can it? Just when you think things can't get any worse, they do get worse. Perhaps the young man began to rue what he thought of as his fate. How could I be so unlucky? When circumstances turn against a man, he often reasons poorly. Uh, the truth is he had only himself to blame, and the reality was he was now living in a strange land, impoverished, and he needed a job. So in verse 15, uh, the Lord in uh, the parable describes what the younger brother did then. He hired himself, himself out to one of the citizens of that far country. Uh, this, was, this was the best he could do. He was given a job in the fields feeding swine. Dad hadn't fixed him up with one of dad's old friends uh, taking a cush job at, at his company. Dad didn't know where he even was. No, this was a Gentile's farm. The boy had sunk to the lowest level possible in the eyes of a fellow Jew. He was now a pig farmer. 
You can imagine how when Jesus got to this part of the story, the Pharisees uh, listening outside must have winced in revulsion. The very thought uh, was vile to them. The complete degradation uh, Jesus then illustrated in verse 16 by probing the younger brother's thoughts. He was so hungry, if possible, he would have filled his stomach with the same grimy carob pods the filthy pigs were eating. But even that wasn't available to him, for the pigs were more important to the farmer than him. That was how low he had fallen. He had left to find his freedom. Now he was worse than a slave. He had longed for the good life. Now he is living the worst life. Naturally, shame and disillusionment over his poor decisions overcame him. Leon Morris observed how hardship has a wonderful way of bringing people to face facts. And so the turning point appears in verse 17. But when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread, but I am dying here with hunger. This is what I'm going to do. And then he recited to himself what he had resolved to confess to his father when he returned to him. Uh, this was the younger son's repentance. I called it a turning point. Uh, coming to one's senses was a, a common phrase at the time, just as it is today. But it's, it's not a phenomenon that comes spontaneously. Uh, we must be enabled to come to our senses. And the boy's confession and who it is directed toward makes that apparent. He could see clearly now and in the clarity, he knew what he must do. His original misconception of what the world and its pleasures offered outside his father's home had vanished. And in its place, he felt a deep desire to return there, but not just return there must first be confession of sin. And with firm resolve, he said to, my, to himself, I will get up and go to my father. He wasn't just homesick. It wasn't the flora and fauna of home, so to speak, or its comforts, or its beautiful nightly sunsets that beckoned him. It was his father, his knowledge of him and past experience with him were reeling him in. And he began to long for what was once so real to him. It resembled an emotional release grounded in the revelation, uh, now clear to him that his father was a forgiving father and he would welcome his prodigal son home. Perhaps uh, you've experienced something similar in your life. Uh, you too once strayed and, and fell prey to the lust of the world and the expected enjoyment of forbidden pleasures. If not physically, uh, spiritually, you journeyed a distance away, gradually further and further, rarely giving thought to what you were leaving behind. But your heavenly father reeled you in too. You remember it. He made you miserable and it turned into sweet misery for it brought you too to your senses and you longed for the relationship you once had, the security that was yours and the certainty that you were walking down a path that led to better things. And confession and repentance played its role, bursting forth from you as it did with the prodigal son. Verses 18 and 19 give us uh, the confession the young son pronounced. Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, I am no longer worthy uh, to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. 
He had sinned against his father in so many ways, but he now knew without doubt that he had first sinned against God. That was his leading rebel act and was the basis for his subsequent offense against his father. Such behavior denied him any claim to be considered his son. He could only plead the mercy of attaining to servitude in his home where he would have a job and food to eat. But you can already feel the sense of purpose and relief. There was wind in his wings as he anticipated the reunion. And now the father of the two sons assumes the leading role in the parable. Uh, the younger brother left uh, the far country and made his way to his father's home. And this is very interesting. Uh, while he was still a long way off, the father appears to be watching for him. Uh, perhaps the son had his own uh, distinctive gait. Most of us do. Uh, but Jesus says that he saw him from that distance and recognized him and felt compassion for him and ran and embraced him and kissed him. The old German theologian Helmut Thielich uh, gave a title to the parable, The Waiting Father. And more than one preacher has substituted for the story of the prodigal son, the story of the waiting father. Here we begin to see the heart of the story in the compassion, and I would add passion, of the father as regards uh, first his younger son, but then also later the older. This is that word uh, translated typically as here, compassion. We see so often in the Gospels ascribed to Jesus himself when in the face of the ravages of sin or death, there arises instant pity in his innermost being, a kind of aching love stirred up uh, within himself. A stronger expression could not be found to describe the loving posture of the father toward his wayward son. He runs. Uh, the commentators uh, make much of the fact that older men in this day and age felt it undignified to run, uh, but he ran to his son and embraced him and, and unashamedly kissed him over and over again. He personified unconditional forgiveness in his posture toward him. It, it signaled not that the son was worthy of his affections, but that the father forgave him in spite of his unworthiness. And here we're able to see, I think, what Jesus was doing, how he intended the father in the parable to represent our own heavenly father. Here is Psalm 103 personified compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. Just as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. Then in verse 21, uh, the, the son responded as he had previously planned. He, he began to pour out his heart to his father with his sincere confession, first acknowledging that he had sinned against heaven and against him, uh, then relinquishing the right to be called his son. But the father cut him off, not even allowing the last thing the son wanted to say about becoming a hired hand, instead uh, giving command to his servants to bring out uh, the best robe and, and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sa sandals on his feet, all emblems of sonship and authority and stature. All these gifts the father lavished upon the returning son and endless and merciful reception the son could not have imagined. It's a picture of why many prefer to label this parable the prodigal God 
instead of the prodigal son. For the word prodigal itself actually means uh, recklessly spendthrift. Certainly not found in our household, but recklessly spendthrift. It has the sense of spending until you have nothing left. Although that would not be literally true of God our Father, His resources are inexhaustible. Yet in our experience of His largesse toward us, there is nothing He does not provide for us in His love. And so there followed the command to prepare the celebratory feast. Bring the fattened calf, kill it, and let us eat and celebrate, the Father commands His a servant, because this son of mine uh, was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has uh, been found, and they began to celebrate the joy of the shepherd, remember, who found his lost sheep, and of the woman who found her lost coin. Here the three parables are joined in all their significance by the father rejoicing over the lost son found. He who was as good as dead to him now alive and at home. The Pharisees and scribes at this point could not have been pleased. They were insulted by the picture conveyed of free forgiveness without some work being accomplished. But that was to misread uh, the story. Par parables have their limitations. Every time we're, we're taught a parable here, we hear that. They, 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 they have a purpose, but they also have limitations. Uh, the story is not, in T.W. Manson's words, a complete compendium of theology. Uh, Jesus had made plain in other places and would yet more clearly and forcibly in the weeks ahead that he himself was the Lamb of God who takes away sin by burying it in sinner's place. Uh, God's justice will never be compromised. But being rich in mercy, he makes the dead in sin alive, uh, justifying his lost sons and daughters freely from, uh, through the sacrifice and the satisfaction that he provides in, in a substitute in his only begotten son. It's the Father who draws his sinful own to himself by his spirit. And when they respond, as did the prodigal son, and turn to him to confess and repent and seek his mercy, he comes running to greet them and clothe them in garments of righteousness and welcome them home as his own. God loves those who come home from the far country. This was cause for a celebration then, and it demanded a feast. So the father uh, called for the fattened calf to be killed so that they could eat it and celebrate. This was another indication of the wealth of the family, that they would have such an animal available on a moment's notice. A fattened calf was one that had been specially fed and set aside to be slaughtered on a special occasion, and nothing could be more special to the Father than this moment. Isn't it interesting how often in the Bible, when there is cause for celebration, some kind of great banquet is invoked. In Revelation chapter 19, when Christ returns again, his uniting with his bride, the church, is described as a marriage supper. The voice from heaven commanded John to write, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. A marriage supper formed the perfectly suitable picture of heaven's joy at this great event. How appropriate then at this point in the parable for there to be a celebration. Jesus had said there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. But not everyone shared in the joy. Perhaps while narrating this first scene of the parable, Jesus had been directing most of his attention to the sinners and tax collectors, knowing that they would identify with the prodigal son. If so, he likely now turned his body around to, to face the Pharisees. 
Uh, for in introducing now the older brother, he meant to speak to them and drive the full lesson of the parable home. For the older brother gives a vivid depiction of how the Pharisees viewed things. The father's older son was in the field. He'd been working. That is, he'd been where he was supposed to be. He was always where he was supposed to be in his own mind. Uh, like Martha, scurrying around cooking and cleaning and doing the dishes while Mary sat at Jesus' feet, the older brother was wearily aware that someone had to do these necessary things. It's surprising that no one had gone out into the field to tell him the news. And besides the father, no one should have had more of an interest in his brother's return home than his older brother. Perhaps it was because the party had begun in a quick and spontaneous way, you know, giving the benefit of the doubt, but more likely it was because there was no real warmth within the family ever since the younger brother had left them. The, the father didn't send word because he knew it would not be welcome. On the older brother's part, there had been only seething resentment since his brother left. So when he drew near and began to hear the unmistakable sounds of a full-scale party taking place with music and dancing, he held back, uh, perhaps fearing what he would discover. Instead of going in, he summoned a, a servant uh, to ask. The servant replied merely with the bare facts in verse 27. Your brother has come and your father has filled the cat and fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. That confirmed it. And he didn't need to know more. Uh, resentment turned into anger and he refused to go and join in but remained outside the grounds, seething. The resemblance to the Pharisees standing outside listening would have been unmistakable. Uh, even now, reading this, we can easily imagine the older brother parroting their words. This man receives sinners and eats with them. But the older son's anger laid bare his own sinful, corrupt heart. After all, what was there to be angry about? What was there to be angry about? If the father had chosen to show mercy to his other son and restore him to his former place in the family? How could the older brother interpret that as an offense against him? His own position had not changed. He still had the advantages and opportunities the firstborn in the family historically had. Nothing of this was lost. In short, the only new thing was the blessing that had become upon his brother through their father's forgiving love. It was envy that was behind his anger. You see that? It was envy and resentment of his father that he had not publicly elevated him above his younger brother. He deserved that. If anyone should have been celebrated and rewarded, it should have been him, the son whose rectitude and good works merited recognition and reward. And now his father was spending resources on the younger brother that arguably came out of the older brother's share of the estate. But if he would not come into the party, the father would go out to the son Verse 28 <clears throat> says his father came out and began pleading with him. For the second time then, the father took the initiative, notice that. And again, he's ready to show mercy. He didn't go out to scold him, but uh, countered his, his anger with a persistent and kind appeal to him. That's the sense of the verb translated pleading. It was tender. But his pleading was met with years of stored up venom. With great disrespect, the older son angrily detailed his grievances. Uh, not bothering even to address his father properly, he explodes with a defiant look. 
look, for so many years I've been serving you and I have never neglected a command of yours and yet you have never given me even a, a young goat, not to mention a fattened calf. You've never even given me a goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came who has devoured your wealth with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. What he delineates before his father is nothing to be admired, though he clearly thought so. It shows how deluded he was in attitude and in character. For so many years I have served you and you have never, never given me reveals not a faithful, loving service to his father, but a long smoldering discontent over the return on his actually commercial investment. He never neglected a command. There's the currency of the transactional character of the relationship with his father as the older son viewed it. Where's my reward? Where's my compensation? As one of the students of the parable put it, he was a man in his father's house, but he was not a son. He was a servant. And now he demands his wages. He let slip this verbal gaffe. I have served you. He had been as much a slave as the brother in the distant land, slopping pods for the pigs. He hadn't had to leave the farm in order to leave his father. He had never really known him as father, which is why likely he could not understand the relationship the father now had with his younger brother. <clears throat> not that he could bring himself to call him his brother, Bitterly, he was this son of yours. He was the one who had taken away what joy he could conjure because his brother's repentance and return had distracted from his own luster. All the righteous structure of his life to this point was an empty uh, artifice. He represents the onlooking Pharisees. Uh, their outward life, uh, blameless, but inside they're joyless and self-righteous. At another time, you know, Jesus would call them whitewashed tombs. So the central figure in the parable has become the father who reaches out in sacrificial love uh, to both of his sons. But the older son had no love for his father. He only loved the image he had been projecting as his favorite son. The father's response in the final two verses uh, brings us back to the theme of the chapter, uh, the love of God for his wayward children and the irrepressible joy over the lost who are found and the dead who are brought to life. He addresses his older son affectionately. Notice, uh, son, technon. Uh, the Greek, the tender word for a son, not just a term of position, you're my son, but buddy, you've always been with me and all that is mine is yours. On the first point, the older son had been correct. He had always been there. There's a warning implicit in that, especially for a group like ours, me and you. It's likely we have some uh, older brothers among us uh, even now uh, living lives void of any type of relationship with our Heavenly Father but smug in our outward conformity. Kent Hughes wrote, it is possible for elder brothers to leave the father without leaving the farm. You can be lost in a distant land for sure or you can be lost in the Father's house. The question is, is your relationship with the Father one of a son or one of empty religion? Two sons, 
and one father's love. As it turns out, the seemingly less likely one becomes the obvious one. If the older brother could not bring himself to call him brother, his father would do him the favor. This brother of yours was dead and has begun to live and was lost and has been found. We had to celebrate and rejoice. It was necessary. That's the meaning of that. We had to celebrate. It was, it was a, a divine necessity to celebrate because there's more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. But then the seemingly obvious brother becomes, is it less likely? Less likely to be found and begin to live in the joyful security of his father's love? The father is watching for him too. We're not told. Uh, the invitation for him is left hanging in the air as Jesus looks in pity toward the scribes and the Pharisees. Two sons, both lost, though in different ways. Two separate audiences to Jesus' parable, sinners and Pharisees. One with newfound hope in the grace and mercy of a forgiving father. The other still seething over the insult to their self-righteous pride. And the father beckons them both to come home. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for going and finding us when we were lost <clears throat> Thank you for giving life to us when we were dead in our trespasses and sins. Thank you for being the kind of father who uh, will do everything necessary to bring your sons and daughters home to enjoy celebration with you. Thank you for the one who made it possible you didn't spare him. Uh, you sent him here, and he brought the lost, the dead, home with him. We're grateful. We pray that we would live lives that are filled with true uh, obedience, with true righteousness, with, with true uh, acts of mercy and service because they're given with thankful hearts. All these things we pray in Jesus' name, amen.